Yeah. All right, guys, hopefully this will be our last session on uh, legal jurisprudence and legal theory. Let me just, uh, yeah, come in, please. Shut the door fully when you come in. All right. Um, what have we covered here? We have covered the science element. Karl Popper and the definition of science has been covered. And um, we, where we, uh, uh, we've covered civil law systems versus common law. This we have covered. Okay, inquisitorial. Just tell me where we, because between section A and B, I've uh, kind of. Yeah. We came to hierarchy of courts. Yes, come in. Please. So we came to the hierarchy of courts. What is the problem? Hai? Kya hai? Okay, guys, uh, so we were started, uh, we started on stare decisis, did we? We didn't start. Okay, so we just kind of stopped at hierarchy of courts. Okay, fine. Let's do this then. Uh, let me also go and open the, um, the Glanville Williams article. Huh. This is the other mic, right? Uh, anyway, let this work initially, at least let my mic work. This can come later. This is a, I was just worried about the red light. So I don't know whether it's going to conk out or not. Okay. All right, guys. So let's just open this and let's continue now with um, story decisis. Uh, so we didn't start this topic at all, right? Okay. So this is one of the most. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, this one you can just fix later. Okay. Um, so, stare decisis is one of the most important aspects of what we call the common law jurisdictions, which is <clears throat> what. Are, uh, give me some examples. Uh, did I tell you about uh, some examples of common law jurisdictions? We didn't. Yeah. Okay. So, all the uh, all the English colonies, okay, from Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, I mentioned it. I think when I discussed common law versus civil law jurisdictions, we discussed okay all the Australia, India, Can uh, Canada, US. These are all referred to as common law jurisdictions, and I think I also referred to why, uh, strictly speaking, these are actually now mixed jurisdictions. We mentioned that as well because a pure common law jurisdiction means that there is no statutory law at all, which means there's no parliament making any laws. Okay, all you have to go by are the previous decisions of judges on similar cases that's a pure common law system that's how english law developed okay uh, but it's a very rich body of law even if you just look at the pure body of common law before the parliament started making uh, you know laws it's still a very rich and very comprehensive set of laws okay that's why it's taken hold in so many countries around the world so stare decisis or the doctrine of uh, precedent is uh, a very important aspect of this common law system okay so what it essentially means is uh, here as you can see here the translation of the latin word of the latin expression Sir? yes to stand by uh, precedence and not to disturb so basically don't disturb what's already been settled that's the idea okay so what you will see here is the overarching theme of consistency okay because and you can once again connect it the idea you, you can see why this is con conducive to con consistency okay yeah so briefly what uh, what the doctrine of precedent means is that uh, when you have a particular case that has been decided in a, a in a given way yes this 10 minutes uh, grace is very disruptive actually it essentially means that the class starts about 10 minutes late okay there is a brief um, okay yeah you can read the you can understand this a little bit uh, better from the uh, uh, this particular paragraph in the Glanville Williams article is the font size big enough for everyone yes. at the back okay so uh, you can see here essentially what we say by the doctrine of judicial precedent what do we mean 
uh, is suppose that in a certain case you have facts A and B and uh, fact A is deemed to be immaterial okay so only a uh, B and C are deemed to be material by the court okay and I presume you guys have read this article by now okay so you have to understand what is meant by a material fact that is a fact what is uh, a fact that has legal salience okay so in a drunk in a, in a car accident if the driver was drunk that is a material fact but if the driver was wearing a red shirt that's not a material fact okay that fact does not have legal salience okay so here what are the, what do they mean so essentially we have in this case facts B and C are material okay if you have a case like this and then uh, the court reaches conclusion X okay uh, in this particular case where B and C are material what the doctrine of precedence is telling you essentially is that in any future case where B and C are, are the material facts okay which means essentially the fact is the the case is very similar on facts as far as the material ca ca facts are concerned no case is going to be identical on all the facts but material facts it's it's similar then the court must decide it in the same way as it has decided the earlier case okay so the conclusion here also must be x okay is this clear so can you see how this is conducive to consistency okay so if the court is consistent in deciding cases okay of all flavors then do you think it will create a more predictable system for the citizens and the people who live in the country yeah or businesses and uh, you know normal uh, individuals so that is the whole idea so you can connect this uh, as to if you if you think about why do we need this doctrine why do we need judges to be consistent so one of the ways you can connect it is, is to this need for a legal system you can then go back to the purpose of the legal system and you can think about okay why if you have a legal system that is conducive to a stable and predictable kind of environment then is that going to be good for business or bad for business it should be good for business because it will help people to plan okay and it will also be fairer because people will have some idea as to how even in your individual lives you can conduct yourself better but mainly it has a very big impact on the business environment okay because uh, if you have a stable and predictable environment then uh, businesses can plan long term okay obviously economic uncertainty does not go away but at least regulatory uncertainty if you have some confidence about regulations and taxes and things like that yeah yeah uh, <clears throat> Again, I've lost the internet connection. Lalitha, I think we have to tell these guys again why um, I've lost that connection. One minute. There seems to be a problem with the internet today. Huh? Um, just give this to them. This, we have to, might have to message these guys. Um, there seems to be a problem with uh, Larita. Just one sec. Because I just connected to this network and I lost it. So there is no connection here. I'll just work on my, uh, I'll use my own geo. But we need to just message these guys, <coughs> the IT guys. Because even in the office, our PGDM 201 is not coming. Okay. Uh, so I'll just work with this. Okay. So is this clear, guys, that the idea of the of consistency and a stable and predictable business environment, uh, is, uh, especially the regulatory environment, taxes, it helps businesses to plan better. Okay. So in fact, you can see a real life case study here where uh, one of the reasons why, if you see, there's a dramatic shift. Yeah. I hope my alarm is working. No. Oh, she's out. So Kanika's out. Why did my alarm never go off? No. Alarm. I tested the alarm and it's not gone off okay so this alarm is a little slow this alarm is a little slow um, so aliens are the aliens are working but the aliens are a little late okay that's the only problem so any anyway Kanika right Kanika is uh, gonna be out today so you're gonna be absent present but absent okay so let's do the, the let's do the attendance I'm just gonna freeze the okay so stare decisis uh, doctrine of pre uh, judicial precedent okay so you can see the value of this so what was i talking about i was talking about the stable and predictable environment for business so you can actually connect this uh, from this theory to a real world event which has happened if you see there was a dramatic improvement in the economy after uh, donald trump took office in the us okay and there was a dramatic jump in consumer confidence business confidence small business confidence this is because uh, there is a very dramatic contrast between the regulatory philosophies of uh, Obama and Trump okay so Obama is more of a you won't get attendance so it's up to you you want to attend um, you know or you want to uh, just hang or hang out somewhere okay 
Um, um, so uh, there's a very dramatic contrast between Obama's uh, uh, regulatory philosophy and Trump's. Okay, so Trump is a free marketer, so he believes in limited government. Is his belief is that the role of government is a very typically capitalist view. Okay, that, that the role of government is to get out of the way and let private enterprise uh, do its thing. Whereas Obama's view is a much more socialistic view of the economy. As you know, he tried to get he did introduce socialized medicine. Okay, so all kind, all this kind, of, and his view was that business is essentially it needs to be heavily regulated. Okay, with excessive consumer protections and things like that. So uh, there was a tremendous uh, regulatory drive within the uh, Obama administration, which actually, uh, sh you know, severely dampened business confidence in the U.S. because people were farmers were losing confidence. You know how the EPA might come after them for all kinds of regulatory breaches. So it was a very dramatic difference, and so you can see firsthand from a re recent example in the real world. You can even give this example if uh, discussion comes up that how there was a dramatic jump in business confidence when Trump came in essentially not even that the tax cuts had passed because the tax cuts took about a year to pass okay but even before the tax cuts were passed because he as a ex as the head of the executive branch was able to dramatically cut regulations in fact Trump's view and then in India also we can take a lesson from this because he's clearly had a dramatically positive impact on the US economy okay which is always a good thing and his view his policy was that I think for every regulation that his the ad administration has introduced, they have cut 22 regulations. Okay, I think Mr. Modi also did something like this, but it was not so drastic. I think he also had similar a similar idea. But in in the U.S., Trump has been actually very very uh, aggressive in cutting regulation. That was one of his main promises that I will dra drastically cut regulation. And so this obviously uh, creates a lot more, and businesses get to realize that there's a business friendly administration in charge. So then uh, the laws are likely to be pro-business. So this creates a big jump in. This leads to a big jump in business confidence. Okay. So we have deviated quite a bit from the from the legal aspect of the uh, judicial precedent. But you need to be able to study everything from a multidisciplinary point of view. Okay. It's not you don't need to be locked in a silo that we only look at the law. We can see the connection between the law and the, and the real world. And so the obje objective here, one of the important ways, uh, you won't get attendance. So it's your choice how you want to use your time. So you can do whatever you guys so I won't repeat this every time so if, obviously if I tell you you won't get attendance means uh, you can either come or you can go and hang out in the library or canteen or wherever okay um, so um, so what was I saying so the, this Im connects to the important idea that uh, you know one of the important roles of a legal system if you think about what is the role of a legal system so one of the important roles of a legal system is uh, to uh, create a stable and predictable environment so that businesses can prosper okay there is a max uh, business uh, uncertainty you know uh, business optimism is revived and this is one of the as I said everything down at the end of the day everything boils down to economics if a country can't get its economy in order then everything Thing falls apart okay you can see another very good test case in the real world today which is have you are you guys following the situation in Venezuela yes you know what is going on there's a lot of unrest people are like eating dogs and stuff like that there's no food it's, it's a total disaster and do you know do you know that Venezuela has larger proven oil reserves than Saudi Arabia the highest oil proven oil reserves in Venezuela are, are in actually in Venezuela and there is total mismanagement okay it's a socialist government and they have totally messed up the economy can you imagine a country like that with so much oil wealth and it's a total disaster now there's chaos there's fighting and looting on the streets people are eating dogs there's no food in the supermarkets it's a total disaster if you want to see a test case uh, mm -hmm. of how so you know what socialism does you can go to Venezuela okay you can go and check maybe don't go there maybe don't go there but just follow the situation in fact if you remember uh, when Donald Trump gave his first speech at the United Nations he made the statement that the reason that Venezuela is in uh, such a bad shape today is not because socialism wasn't implemented properly but it's because socialism was implemented properly and that's why you have this situation so anyway so uh, again you can see here that okay it, to some extent I'm actually you can sense that I'm more of a free marketer I don't believe in socialism but then that's these are not I mean I, I'm not going to require you to subscribe to my because these are political uh, economic philosophies okay so if you want to be a socialist you can still subscribe to it you need to be aware of the two different philosophies you need to be aware of the facts and you need to be aware uh, you need to be able to defend your position okay so if you are going to believe in socialism you need to be able to defend your position that's all that is required okay so uh, but at the same time it's important for you the reason I tell you all this and reason I give you some of my views is 
uh, this will give you because you're much younger than me so your views are not so well formed maybe and you're not so uh, you're not able to articulate it so well so when you look at my views so I'm like a radical free marketer okay so when you see my views what you see uh, not because you have to follow my views that's not why I'm telling you my views or giving you my views by looking at the way I speak and the, um, my uh, you know the whole world view you can see what a well articulated and consistent set of views looks like okay so you can have the same type of views on the other side of the socialist uh, argument okay but uh, when you look at my views you'll get to see what a well articulated and, and a consistent set of views looks like on one side of the spectrum okay so the role of the legal system is uh, important role is in fostering a stable and predictable environment and hence you can connect this to the idea of stare decisis hence we have a requirement that we don't want to disturb previous uh, you know and we want to stick be consistent in the way we decide cases okay so this is broadly the idea of stare decisis now to understand there are two other terms that we need to learn okay so vertical uh, versus horizontal stare decisis what does this mean you can connect this once again to the hierarchy of courts you are already aware that we have everyone has a broad idea that you have the district courts then you have the high courts and then you have the supreme court so there is a hierarchy and everyone knows what a hierarchy is okay so when we say vertical stare decisis all this is all that it means okay <coughs> okay power of higher courts to bind lower courts okay if you look at there is an article in our constitution 141 which actually ex expressly uh, lays this out okay this is just because this is the title of the section and this is the section itself it's the same uh, that the law decry uh, so it's mentioned in the constitution okay in case it wasn't obvious that is mentioned in the constitution that if the supreme court decisions will be binding on all courts within india okay so if there is any kind of a case uh, which is decided by the supreme court on a particular matter and you're arguing a similar case in any high court in the country or a district court you can cite this as a precedent you can cite the supreme court case as a precedent and it will be binding on the lower court okay because of article 141 it will be binding on the lower court and so here we will say there are actually two two sets of terms we need to learn one is um, uh, vertical stare decisis versus horizontal and then uh, we will also learn about binding precedence versus persuasive precedence okay so uh, so we just use this term here that i gave you an example where you take a decision from the uh, supreme court and you're arguing a case in a district court or a high court and then you cite that supreme court decision which happens to be the same as your uh, the material facts are the same as in your case so you cite that supreme court case as a binding as a as a precedent okay so it will be a case of vertical stare decisis because this higher court is binding the lower court and it will also be a case of what we call binding precedent okay because the lower court is bound to follow it okay that's what is meant by a binding precedent okay some people sometimes use the word bounded i am bounded please don't say that you're bound but there's no such thing as bounded okay i'm bound by my promise okay so uh, okay so these are the two terms we uh, additional terms that we need to know uh, the four terms actually vertical versus horizontal and uh, binding versus persuasive okay so let's come to that a little bit and let's understand what is horizontal stare decisis okay so horizontal you can read this for yourself i'm not going to repeat everything okay so uh, generally we we uh, if you look at this uh, this discussion you can read up on, in detail on, on your own later on but the general principle is this that in the high courts for instance if you say in, in the high courts you have different strength you have this concept of a bench strength you understand what a bench is right yeah. so in in the law we refer to the judges as the bench and then the uh, the lawyers are the bar okay and so uh, and so uh, as far as the benches are concerned you can actually have a single judge bench or you can sometimes have a two judge bench okay or sometimes a three judge bench in the high court okay and then uh, you can have a full bench also okay of the high court so that's uh, quite rare actually in in india so, yes. when we have with an international court when uh, have seen in the un when there was this case in for india and pakistan so there are this uh, some five six judges sitting in the yeah international so international court of justice is different they have a they always sit on the, i think they i I'm, I'm not sure that uh, whether there's a it's, it's always but i have never seen them sitting in a, a smaller strength they're always sitting on the full bench okay the full bench of the icj sits okay mm -hmm. so the icj essentially is a jurisdiction you can opt for that jurisdiction if two countries want to like this kulbushan yadav case is being argued there okay so uh, there uh, we both countries have agreed to accept the jurisdiction of the icj and therefore we have taken the case there okay 
So that's a that court is slightly different. They sit on, always on the full bench. Okay, even the U.S. Supreme Court, when it sits, it's always sits on a uh, full bench, what is called on bank in the U.S. Okay, uh, but in India, we don't sit on the full bench uh, on a full bench. It's, it never sits like that actually and then sometimes you have these what is called the constitution bench for constitutional issues which is five judges sometimes nine judges okay sometimes 11 judges okay but full bench in the supreme court in india is very rare okay so you have the concept of bench strength now the concept of horizontal story decisis essentially is it is also connected to bench strength broadly what it means is that the same court is bound by its previous decisions so if you're arguing in the calcutta high court before a single judge and you have a previous decision say for from several years ago for of a single judge of the calcutta high court and the material facts are the same so you can actually uh, you know you can actually say to the single judge in your case that you are bound you can actually pressurize the judge you can use that precedent so even the uh, in horizontal story decisis we say that a court is bound is bound by its own uh, previous decisions okay unless you can show that there's something seriously wrong with the previous decision in general by default you understand what default means yes. the default rule the default rule is that the court is bound by its own previous decision so in the calcutta high court if you have a single judge and you have a previous decision of a single judge or two judges or three judges of the calcutta high court you can actually pressurize that judge in your case and say look at this case it was decided by this court and these are the material facts the same facts as in my case so therefore i should also get the same decision okay you can actually put pressure and they're actually bound to do it unless they can show that there's something wrong if they feel there's something wrong and then they have to essentially they can't even overrule a single like a single judge feels there's something wrong with the previous single judge decision he will have to refer that to the chief justice so that the chief justice can constitute a larger bench so the basic you get the basic principle that if you want to overrule you need a higher strength you need a larger uh, larger bench essentially so a three judge bench can overrule a decision of a single judge okay so even they will try to honor it unless they feel that there's something wrong so if you have a single judge calcutta high court decision and then you're arguing before a three judge bench you cite a precedent and if they don't unless they can show that there's something wrong they are also required to follow it because it's the same high court but if they feel there's something wrong they themselves can overrule because there's a larger bench okay so you can see the connection here i mean how the rule operates that if it's three i mean you need a larger bench to overrule yes Sir, let's try and use the mics guys can pass it to him and let's have the mics so that yeah yeah Sir, not working not working you should be able to sense that it's not working yeah. Sir, are interstate courts on the same level bound to follow the judgments of the other court or okay. is it on the same I got level? I got your point. Okay, very good question. So this leads us to our other question which is the other dis discussion which is on persuasive precedence binding precedent you already understand okay if it's a supreme court decision everybody's bound okay in general also courts are bound by their own decisions uh, under horizontal study decisis but the question that rajan is asking is about uh, you know states uh, courts in different states so if you are arguing a case before the madras high court and you have a decision of the delhi high court on a similar point okay exactly similar to your case i mean material facts are similar uh, then you can cite that precedent before the Madras High Court, but the Madras High Court is not bound to follow it. Okay, so in this case, we say that this precedent is persuasive. As far as the Madras High Court is concerned, the, the Delhi High Court decision on the same point is a persuasive precedent, but not a binding precedent. Okay, but a persuasive precedent doesn't mean that it will not be followed. Because it is still possible that the Madras High Court may be very, um, you know, impressed by the logic and the reasoning of the Delhi High Court decision and they, they, may, they may decide to rule in the same way. So it is still possible. So even if you have a persuasive precedent, if you think the reasoning is very good, it is still worth citing it because it might end up being followed. Okay, because judges have to give decisions, although they have a lot of uh, discretion. Uh, there is the other aspect of judgments is, as you will see when you do your judgments, that they don't, don't say that, okay, this guy wins. They have to give a, uh, they have to give uh, uh, detailed uh, reasons for why they're ruling in a particular way. Okay, these are called speaking orders. Okay, normally when you give any kind of orders, even if it's a, sh a shorter order, you have to give a, what is called a speaking order. Okay, which means your order should give the reasons for coming to that conclusion. Okay, okay. so in, if a judge issues an order which is not a speaking order, that is considered to be bad, essentially bad form. <coughs> All right. 
so uh, these two terms you understand what is judicial precedent now we can talk about vertical or horizontal stare decisis these terms are clear now okay and you can read this article by this this extract from Subarau's judgment okay and so we have binding precedence versus persuasive precedence and these are all terms that you need to know okay all right now this brings us to the ratio decidendi okay if you see what we are saying in um, in the doctrine of precedent uh, of uh, in stare decisis we are saying is that previous decisions have to be followed okay but if you look at a judgment if you look at any judgment it's a big judgment how when what and the question might arise now which part of this judgment should i follow okay so this is where we bring in the idea of ratio decidendi and the answer essentially is going to be that it's only the ratio decidendi of the case that needs to be followed okay so uh, not the other parts okay and so ratio this is the plural ratio nes is the plural okay and there is something we'll define which is called orbiter dictum this these not need does not need to be followed and here again the plural is this so uh, the broad answer is that when you are following previous judgments under the rule of stare decisis it is the ratio decidendi of previous judgment that's need to be that needs to be followed okay and that's why you will see that it's as it's mentioned in the glanville williams article also that understanding the ratio of a case is uh, is very important okay and in many cases you will find even seasoned lawyers don't really understand the ratio of cases that they are citing so it's quite uh, difficult actually to grasp uh, the the ratio of a case i wouldn't say it's difficult but it just have you just have to be uh, you know alert and uh, you have to be able to understand the reasoning properly so um, so it's, it's not something that is easy and it's an art it's not a uh, there's not a science it's not a formula like you put h2o and you get water <coughs> so you always do that you can do it with your eyes closed so it's not like that it's something that requires a lot of judgment okay and the more you read uh, judgments the the better your i mean you 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 uh, your skill improves as far as detecting the ratio of a case is concerned okay so when you see when you do the judgments that we do uh, further down in the course uh, you know further on in the course uh, one of the types of questions you'll get is what is the ratio of this case okay uh, that it's that itself is uh, is going to be difficult for you to figure out okay all right so uh, let's understand ratio decidendi uh, an orbiter dictum okay here's our article okay let's uh, so you have some idea about the ratio now what he's saying is now this is um, the part about the doctrine of precedent okay Okay, so it has a discussion about the. Um, so you guys are all familiar with this case now. You read this case, Wilkinson versus Downton. You can already see in this case, just to note as an aside here, uh, there is there are two claims that Mrs. Um, Wilkinson has made. Okay, uh, that is uh, one is on the railway fares. Okay. Uh, that she spent money on and that the second is obviously the main part of the damages that she's claiming is for nervous shock for that hundred pounds okay so the first part you can see here how the first part is decided very easily by the judge and you can see here one of the other advantages of the doctrine of stare decisis is that it uh, helps judges to reach decisions more quickly okay you don't have to spend you don't have to reinvent the wheel because there's already a previous decision on similar points okay so what he says here he uses this uh, precedent of Pasley versus Freeman okay which is a case where so he's saying when he's saying this this is what he means that clearly within the decision of Pasley versus Freeman means that this matter of the railway fares okay is covered by the logic of the decision in Pasley versus Freeman so I don't need to reinvent the wheel and go through the decision again and uh, so this first part is just you can see here an application of uh, stare decisis okay to decide some of the issues in the case all right um let's just i just want to go back so he's worked on this ratio decidendi um in uh, in stages okay he's talking about how it is to be extracted uh, so there's a lot of levels of abstraction uh, then um yeah this is the part essentially okay so finally what what is the dis uh, ratio that he's extracting from this particular case okay that he has done because uh, downton has done something with intent to affect the plaintiff in body or mind and there is an adverse effect okay so whatever damage he has caused he is liable to pay uh, to compensate for that okay so this is the ratio so one of the things that you would note in this ratio so i haven't gone through the whole article okay it will take us too much time but if you have any questions about any part of the article you can ask me okay 
so uh, so essentially this is the ratio so you can see one thing about the ratio is that it is extracted or uh, stated in a fairly general way at a high level of abstraction okay it's in a fairly general way uh, and it's not something that is uh, very very specific to the facts of the case you can still connect it to the facts of the case but the ratio has to be stated as a general principle okay so if somebody has committed murder and he is being sentenced to death because he is being first held liable for the crime of murder okay so he say we say that he intentionally uh, caused the death of another person by through his actions okay so that is how murder is defined in the uh, in the statute and so we say that what his actions match the definitions in the statute the ingredients of the statute so therefore he is held to be guilty of murder okay and so we basically obviously in that particular fact obviously there is one person mr a who has murdered mr y okay so all these facts are also bound in uh, into the decision that the court gives okay uh, the court does not give a general decision the court obviously said that mr x is guilty uh, because mr a is guilty because he has murdered mr y okay and this is why we think he has murdered because his actions were intentional and it caused the death of this person etc so uh, the point is from the specific facts of the case because the court decision will always be on the specific facts of the case but from there you have to extract a general principle so the idea is remember ratio descendant means reason for deciding okay so you have to go behind the mind of the judge into the mind of the judge and understand what was his logic for arriving at this kind of decision that's all that the ratio is okay so what are the general principles he's using to arrive at this decision okay so that is what you have to look at reason for deciding so what are the general principles he has applied to arrive at the conclusion in this case okay so the general principles are connected to the facts of the case and then uh, the conclusion that is reached on those principles so that's essentially your ratio descendant is this clear we'll have a better idea as we go on okay kushbu you are clear about yeah no, actually, sir. try to use the mic although you don't need it on the first bench but let's get into the habit everybody should get used to the mic yeah i hope you are not nervous about speaking on the mic no. okay many people are nervous they don't want to they want to avoid the mic yes So like uh, there are uh, if there are two set up if there are two similar closer closer make sure the voice comes through the mic you need to be able to sense that yes if there are two similar cases and there are similar material facts you said that the judge is bound by uh, uh, bound by the decision of past not always if it's a pers- if it's a persuasive precedent he's not bound you have to remember that because you made a statement in a very general way the judge is bound only if there is vertical stare decisis operating in which case a higher court is binding him okay but if it's uh, because your statement was very general that's why i'm qualifying your statement it's not your statement will not be true if the precedent is a persuasive precedent that means you're taking a, a delhi high court decision to a calcutta high court case so the calcutta high court is not bound to follow the decision of the delhi high court so that's a persuasive precedent okay so yeah you said bound so i just wanted to qualify that okay yeah If 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 there is no possibility uh, possible, so is the uh, uh, judge bound to take uh, that pressure on him to pass similar statement just because it was mentioned in the similar case? Yes, that's the whole meaning of stare decisis. So if the judge doesn't like that case. so we'll come to these points of distinguishing okay we'll come to these points of distinguishing where you can see some part of your un- of some answer to your question but by and large what we are, what i would say is that if the judge cannot show if he, if the judge cannot we'll see what distinguishing is so if the judge cannot distinguish that case in any way okay or he cannot show that there is some kind of uh, uh, there there appears to be something wrong with the previous decision because courts do overturn decisions okay even our supreme court has overturned decisions like stood for 10 years like in the case in arbitration we had a famous case called bhartiya international versus bulk trading which stood it's a supreme court decision which stood for 10 years but then a similar decision came up before the supreme court and a three judge bench essentially said that you know we feel there's something wrong with this case with this decision so they referred it to the chief justice and then the chief justice convened a larger bench and they essentially eventually ended up overruling bhartiya international versus bulk trading which are the case which stood for 10 years okay so it's a supreme court case so unless the judge says so to so yes a broad answer is yes he is always bound unless he it's a persuasive precedent a b unless he can show unless he can distinguish the case in some way or c unless he can show that there's something wrong there seems to be something wrong or grossly wrong with the decision okay like in the us you had decisions like dred scott and uh, okay where you had the us supreme court saying that you know slaves are not human 
slaves do not cannot become citizens etc and that decision was overturned okay eventually so so unless you can show that there's something wrong so un with these three qualifiers otherwise he is bound okay that's the uh, that's how the system works okay all right so is this you have some idea now about what ratio decident is okay read on further and then we now let's look, come look, come to these important points of distinguishing okay there are uh, two types of distinguishing here all right oh sorry so uh, first is ratio decidendi and as it also is mentioned in the glanville williams case i'm not going to spend too much time on this that is obiter dictum so everything that is you can pretty much say that everything that your court says in its judgment okay everything it says in its judgment which is not essential to reaching the conclusion in the case okay so the court may opine on a host of other issues okay but you just have to uh, take a very parsimonious you want to understand what is parsimonious parsimonious means stingy you know what stingy is stingy you don't know okay stingy no not me stingy means essentially uh, not willing to spend anything okay so being very very keeping it very minimal okay so you have to take only the minimum so essentially when you're trying to extract the ratio decidendi okay ratio decidendi you have to be very you have to take only the bare minimum logic that is required to reach the conclusion okay only the bare minimum logic that is required to lead the reach the conclusion in the case other than everything else can be regarded as extraneous okay just the bare minimum logic okay that should be the idea so essentially <coughs> the court discusses all kinds of things <coughs> one of the reasons it engages in all these discussions is that the advocates cite a lot of cases okay as you can see because um, as you can anticipate because we have this uh, in in the common law jurisdictions we have an adversarial system okay so the two are advocates will argue against each other in front of the court and uh, each other against each other's positions and one of the things they're going to do because stare decisis applies so one of the things that every advocate will try to do he will cite, try to cite a bunch of cases he will try to cite a lot of precedents which according to him are in his favor okay and so therefore he will try to pressure the judge to rule according to those precedents and decide in his favor and the other guy on the other side is also doing the same thing okay so there's a bunch of in every decision that is being uh, you know uh, arrived at by the court the court would typically have to discuss many precedents which are being cited by both the sides so the good rule of form for judges is that if a uh, advocate is citing a case the judge should discuss the case okay even if he thinks the case is not applicable he should bring up the case okay and he should then say that for a b c d reasons i think this case is not applicable but he needs to bring up the case and knock it off okay he needs to check the box and knock off all the cases that they have mentioned okay so in the course of one of the ways that arbiter dicta is are generated in the case in a particular judgment is because the judge often has to discuss all these cases and many of these cases that you another thing that you'll notice about advocates is many of the precedents that are being cited are quite obviously not relevant oh they're just citing it for the sake of citing <clears throat> but because of that the judge has to deal with it so in the course of doing that he generates a lot of statements which are essentially in the nature of obiter because they are not required to reach the conclusion in the case okay so everything else so you can just look at it as kind of like muscle versus fat okay so the ratio decidendi is the muscle in the case and everything else is fat okay so all the obiter dictum is fat yeah, and the muscle is just the pure base pure bare, bare minimum logic required to reach the conclusion in the case okay as you read right now we are doing it in a very theoretical way when you start looking at actual cases you have this one case here uh, wilkinson versus downton but as you look at more actual cases you'll get a better flavor for it okay all right so this is basically what obiter so obiter does not need to be uh, uh, sort of followed okay so one of the things that lawyers will try to do is that uh, when one uh, the other side's uh, lawyer is actually trying to say that in this particular i'm citing this case and this particular case the ratio of this particular case is a so in abcd that other guy will try to say that no no this abcd is not the ratio of that case that is just obiter in that case because he knows that obiter doesn't have to be followed so he'll try to brand it as obiter okay so this is this argument also goes on so another argument you have is yeah pass the mic back to rajan so another argument type of argument that you have in cases is these two are lawyers and sometimes the court also is not clear about whether something constitutes the ratio of the case or actually just constitutes obiter in that case so what is the ratio of this case you'll see in the supreme court also there'll be up and down arguments about what exactly is the ratio of this case okay yeah 
Sir, as you said that defendant judge can turn down the... Uh, There's no such thing as a defendant judge. You said defendant <laughs> judge. Lawyer, sorry. Yeah, defendant's lawyer. Yeah. yeah. Can turn down the facts that have been cited as the ratio decidendi by the plaintiff's lawyer. So facts are never ratio as such. Logic. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If if the lawyer cites the exact section or the exact law or the exact case on which the decision has been made, so uh, how can the other judge turn down? No, the judge. Judge. You mean advocate. The lawyer, yeah. No, uh, he's not turning down as such. He's he, obviously about the statute, you can never say that. But the statute is never the ratio decidendi. The ratio decidendi of a case is basically that the case lays down a type of principle. Like you can see in this Glenville Williams article that Wilkinson versus Downton was the first case, as he says here. This is a case of first impressions. Okay, so it's a case of first impression means there is no there was no precedent in the English common law for that kind of uh, offense. Okay, what he did. So there was basically so there is a principle that is being laid down in this Wilkinson versus Downton case, which is that a person who intentionally does some act to affect the other person in body or mind and there and causes, uh, you know, an adverse effect will be liable for those, uh, you know, consequences. So that's a first principle. So this is how a ratio SNND would be stated. So this is a principle. So this typically a ratio SNND will not refer to it may refer to it, but it will not be just a particular statute or anything like that. The statute obviously you can't contest because it's written down. Okay. What you would contest is the interpretation of the statute, which you can see later on. Okay. So is this clear? Does it answer your question? Okay. All right. So arbiter dictum does not have to be followed. Only the ratio decidendi has to be followed. So you can see the connection between these three concepts, the hierarchy of courts, then the doctrine of stare decisis, because vertical and binding stare decisis. Okay. And then also uh, horizontal, also connected somewhat to the hierarchy at, at one particular level only. And then the question of ratio decidendi, because if you're going to follow the previous judgment, then the question arises: what part of the previous judgment? And the answer is only the ratio of the previous judgment. This is this clear? Okay. Now let's come to this very important aspect, distinguishing, try to understand this concept. It's, uh, I'm sure many lawyer, practicing lawyers don't understand distinguishing. Uh, even in our uh, LLB course, it was not taught, uh, it was not really discussed in the class. Okay, although thankfully it was there in the reading. Uh, okay, so distinguishing, you have two types. First, we're going to apply the labels and then we will discuss those uh, uh, two types. So we have either non-restrictive or restrictive distinguishing. Okay. So uh, non-restrictive, he is also referred to as uh, genuine distinguishing. Okay, so a non let's do the non-restrictive part not first. The non-restrictive part is uh, is the distinguishing based on facts, on material facts. Okay, so if you if you go back to the gland, let's try and use this article for understanding this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here you see non restrictive distinguishing essentially. Um, all right. So this is what it is. Okay. So non restrictive, you can remember it also as distinguishing based on facts. Okay. So all you try to show is that the case that is, let's say, case A is being cited as a precedent. Okay, and your case is case B and you try to show that in case B there is some difference of material fact. Okay, maybe that the driver was not drunk in particular in case B. Okay, in case A the driver was drunk. Okay, and maybe in case A there was, uh, you know, uh, there was somebody actually got killed. Okay, very may whereas maybe in case B he just kind of rammed into a tree or something. So the damage quality of damage, so there's a material difference. No person was actually hurt. Okay. Uh, so uh, these kinds of things. So the non-restrictive distinguishing is the more uh, is easier to do and is, is more common, which is where uh, you have to try and show that there is a material difference. Uh, there's a difference in material facts between the two cases. So whatever the other party is citing as a precedent, you would try to argue that, well, that cannot be applicable in this case because there is a material uh, fact in this case, which was not present in the other case. Or vice versa. Okay, so difference uh, distinguishing based on material facts. You try to show that the material facts of your case are different from the material facts of the case that is being cited as a precedent. 
okay that is non-restrictive distinguishing now restrictive distinguishing is essentially this okay let me give you an uh, example so in, re in restrictive distinguishing is actually uh, this is the this is the part okay it is called restrictive distinguishing okay that you are actually cutting down the ratio decidendi of a case okay a rule laid down in a particular case if you feel that the rule is too wide obviously only a senior court can do this okay uh, so or uh, the junior court then would have to follow the process by referring it to the chief justice and a larger bench but uh, essentially the idea of restrictive distinguishing is you feel that the ratio of the previous case that was even maybe explicitly laid down in that case but that ratio was unnecessarily wide okay so essentially here you can see i'm just trying to find that part where he mentions um, yeah okay so let me just give you the theoretical this uh, uh, you know uh, i'll just put it down here okay let's say i'm just going to enter into this okay in the in the precedent okay uh, we have uh, material facts uh, were um, a b and c okay a b and c were the actual material facts but the court actually considered only b and c so the idea is uh, theoretically i explain that i'll give you an example so in the case of the precedent and in the current case okay and in the current case which is your case um the material facts are only b and c all right so on the face of it it appears that this is a valid precedent because uh, the court the earlier court only took cognizance of uh, you understand this expression took cognizance yes. took cognizance means i recognized it okay i took cognizance of the fact that gulati came in late that means i i registered that fact in my mind okay it did not that means i'm not un unaware of it i have taken cognizance of the fact okay so this is what it means okay this is what the how the language is used so in the previous in the precedent that is being ci cited the court took cognizance of only two material facts b and c okay but and in your case uh, uh, the in the current case also the material facts are b and c but and so therefore the precedent is being cited okay but if you want to <coughs> restrictively distinguish this what the court will say or what the lawyer will say is that actually uh, the court in the previous case missed out a material fact a which was also present in case a uh, which should have been taken cognizance of by the court but it did not okay so the actual ratio that has been laid down in the case uh, in the precedent should only apply to cases where all three a b c are all material facts but you see in my case only b and c are material facts okay so the court essentially have to say that the court earlier made a mistake okay because it, it failed to recognize the material fact and laid down a rule which is too narrow obviously you can see that a rule based on only b and c is wider uh, it's not too narrow too wide too wide can you see that uh, a K rule based on only b and c is wider than a rule based on a b and c yeah. because in all cases a may not occur along with b and c right so this is basically the theory of non restrict of restrictive distinguishing so you try to argue that the precedent that is being cited actually is uh, based on the uh, uh, wrong uh, uh, on the fa on a failure of the uh, you know the re apparent ratio of that case is based on the failure of the court to recognize a material fact okay which was present in that case so a was present as a material fact but the court failed to recognize it okay and you see in my case the material facts are only b and c so how can you match a case in which the material facts are a b and c to my case where the material facts are only b and c are you following the logic okay now let me give you an example it'll become a little bit better not a very good example but uh, anyway so let's say that the students of dsb go to nus for a business program okay and one of them is carrying a hookah and one of these guys are caught in the hostel in nus smoking a hookah which is against the hostel regulations okay so a bunch of people are caught in a in the hostel and uh, let's assume they were all guys okay although we know that need not always be the case but uh, let's assume they're all guys okay and let's also assume that only let's say just like biologically men can't have babies let's say biologically let's say as a rule girls cannot smoke hookahs okay let's assume for the sake of argument okay i'll show you what the rule is so now what happens is let's say that uh, a judge let's put this in the case of a judge so a judge rules that therefore 
DSB students should not be allowed to come to NUS. Okay, all DSB to no DSB students should be allowed to come to NUS because they are violating hostel regulations by smoking hookahs. Okay, uh, so so this is the rule that is laid down by the judge. Okay, is this clear? Are you following the logic so far? So based on the transgression. Okay, now you could argue that this you know if this ratio is sought to be applied. Okay, to for further batches uh, future batches of DSB students. Now you can argue that you can try to restrictively distinguish distinguish this ruling by saying that look uh, girls do not smoke hookahs and the boys who, and the people who are caught there were all male students so if you have a rule which says no dsb student can come that means you're ruling out all girls and boys okay so what you would argue is that this rule was given this rule was formulated in a very wide manner it 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 basically forbade all dsb students girls and boys but because only boys smoke hookahs okay and only the boys were smoking at that time Therefore, this rule should have been formulated more narrowly to exclude only male DSB students. Okay, are you following the logic? Yes. <coughs> so don't do this if you go there. <coughs> so this is an example of uh, not a good example, uh, but it's an example of uh, what is called restrictive distinguishing. You try to show that the previous rule was unnecessarily wide and was not warranted by the material facts of the case. <coughs> <coughs> so in this case if you uh, give the analogy to a b and c then the judge at nus failed to take into account the material fact that the all the people who violated the rule were all boys okay and the fact that only boys smoke hookahs that he forgot to take uh, which we have artificially assumed which we know is not true right okay so uh, <coughs> right so now you understood what is meant by non restrict uh, by restrictive distinguishing okay so these are very important so please make sure you yeah give him the mic yeah so you told that we assume the boys only sir not you told I'm you asking. said you said either you say you told me or you told us or you say you said so yeah you said that only boys smoke hookah and you said that we assume so in real life cases can also uh, assumptions be considered as facts no no oh. i'm just giving you this artificial example because I wanted to come up with an example. I don't have a better example from an actual case. Okay. I do actually have that, but I don't have the facts on uh, that case. There is an income tax case, which I can show you again later, which is an example of uh, restrictive distinguishing. But I artificially created the situation. In real life, obviously, you can't make assumptions. In real life, if it is true that uh, girls can also smoke hookahs, then obviously, you can't make that assumption in the court. That will not work. I have artificially made this assumption here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, what were we saying here? Okay. So, distinguishing very important. Make sure you understand this concept because, again, I'm sure many lawyers uh, who are practicing may not be able to understand this distinction properly. Okay. <coughs> so, restrictive and non-restrictive distinguishing. That pretty much, I think, does it for us. I've told you not to worry about sub silentio because it's a little more, more complicated concept. Okay. Um, yeah. So, as he is uh, importantly mentioned. Uh, and then there's a discussion of arbiter dicta distinguishing the ability to distinguish a case is an important tool for a lawyer okay because uh, in a common law jurisdiction because everything is based judicial precedents have a huge role to play in decisions okay very very big role to play so therefore the ability to distinguish cases okay is very important because uh, you know that that's like uh, it, it can make the difference between winning or losing a case because judges give a lot of importance to precedents all right okay so this is done i think pretty much we are done with this particular case uh with this particular article so let's go back to this and uh, so distinguishing the two types okay so i've referred you you for this you will refer to the article uh, by glanville williams okay all right now just quickly try to finish up i have artificially cut down this particular module syllabus because we are losing too much time on uh, these introductory mat materials I, I want to get on to the cases <coughs> okay so briefly i'll just spend some uh, time on this case and i should be familiar with these two terms the two terms are phylac and iraq in the u.s you know some some of the people in the u.s refer to iraq as iraq and I iran they say iran okay so iraq and um, uh, and phylac okay so phylac is a term that is used in australian law schools and iraq is used in the u.s law schools so you should be familiar with uh, all that is missing from iraq is that there should be a f in the beginning 
okay so it's actually you can read it in brackets although in the US they don't use the word FIRAC they use the word they use IRAC but they have left out the fax part you can always add that and so then you can compare it with FILAC okay all that is so everything is the same only thing is difference is L and R okay so IRAC is IRAC so I all these are all the same okay and only thing is L is for legal principles in the Australian framework and R is for rules which is the same thing It's basically two different terms for the same thing okay you will consider the legal principles and rules okay so I see a lot of people taking notes I hope you guys are aware you can always take notes you have access to all these notes okay so and then if you want to take additional notes, that's good actually in a way it may help you to remember in, a, in any case I've told you that you should when you study you should actually make your own notes from these notes and maybe listening to the audio I mean listening to the looking at uh, watching the video or whatever okay so this is just a framework that we use use It'll, it might help you to understand the cases <coughs> <coughs> most of you are reading judgments for the first time so first is facts okay it may seem a little bit uh, you know silly to talk about facts because it's so simple but in many cases you'll notice that the facts are also quite complex so it's important to have a good handle on the facts as a famous judge in India I think Krishna Iyer said that first get your facts right then you can twist them as much as you want okay so many times lawyers don't even have the facts right so that is another problem uh, so especially the ones who are very busy they are covering so many cases that they don't have time to read the brief properly okay so <coughs> facts then issues we will understand what issues are okay by the way the, the British pronunciation of this word is actually issues okay whereas in, in the US and India we mostly say issue with the H SH okay but actually the classical British pronunciation is issues there is no H in that okay so uh, anyway so um, you could argue that you know if you're going to speak French you might as well speak like the people in Paris not like the people in Mozambique right <laughs> because that is also that's a French colony so you could you should technically say only uh, issues there's a guy who's uh, who speaks very well you know from your uh, on your English communication skills I might refer you to this guy and you can check uh, on YouTube for this guy called Nigel Farage have you you know but brexit right mm -hmm. so Nigel Farage is the head of the he was the head of the UK independence party and uh, he was one of the moving forces behind uh, the the leave vote in brexit but convincing people to leave so if you listen to Nigel Farage he's a very impressive speaker <clears throat> so you can just google Nigel Farage on uh, on uh, YouTube and listen to all his speeches he speaks very well and you'll notice that these Britishers they all, always say issues okay they don't say issues okay so um, and the, the issues here and then the legal principles okay what so so here when you're discussing the issues in the case there are two you can discuss it at two levels okay we'll come to this when we take a particular case but I'm just giving a broad outline here one is the issues based on the facts of the case itself okay that this this did this person uh, violate section 300 of the IPC okay uh, or did this person's actions uh, attract the provisions of section 300 of IPC now that's a very specific statement and you will actually mention the name of the person also that is how that that statement of the issue is very clear from the way the court writes it in most cases the court will actually write down that the issue in the case in that specific manner okay so uh, and typically when it comes up on appeal etc okay it will be written explicitly by the court what you have to develop a sense for is what is the statement of the issue on a more general level you have to go to a more abstract level because then you can connect it directly to the ratio descendant that will come okay so we'll come to this example but you have to be aware that the issue has to be stated on two levels ideally in your mind that the abstract level also has to be stated and then connected to the ratio descendant obviously legal principles same as rules in the in the US system okay so what are the principles that apply statutory or common law statements of law that are relevant okay statutory means is referring to acts like contract act transfer of property act okay statutory refers to the acts made by parliament and common law principles means we are referring to the judgments okay previous judgments on the same uh, kind of point okay and then obviously first so in, in one stage you'll see this in the judgments the courts typically follow this kind of framework okay without stating it and they will state out they will lay out all the provisions of law that are re relevant statutory provisions then the court the cases that are applicable to this particular situation and then they will apply those principles to the facts of the case okay so pretty much the conclusion the last part okay this has not been bulleted okay um,
okay so the conclusion pretty much is actually redundant but it's there in the framework so i've kept it okay because once you know the legal principles and the application the conclusion is apparent okay but here the conclusion is explicitly stated by the court so we just keep it as a separate part of the discussion okay so this is a framework that you can use we'll see the framework more when we when we look at the um <clears throat> Uh, individual cases okay so here you can see you can just there's a there's a video that I've uh, given this is a good video actually uh, you can read uh, you can watch this video to better understand the Iraq framework okay all right and this last part <coughs> <coughs> I'm just trying to end this module over here artificially because uh, it's getting too long okay so the last point that I want to make this will directly come into the in, into the contract law section is there's a difference between uh, these terms okay acts rules and regulations okay so in the in the in in the in the legal system you'll hear references to what is called the bear act sometimes when you go to the shop to buy a particular act he'll ask you whether you want bear act okay what does bear act means bear act just means that the act only without the rules and regulations okay so this is basically the term that you have to be aware of now rules are made by um, no this is not made by the legislature this the rules are made by the uh, executive branch uh, and uh, regulations this reg stands for regulations okay so do you know what the difference between rules and regulations is this also is useful to be aware of okay so rules are made by the uh, part of the executive branch that is closer to the uh, you know the uh, the prime minister or the head of the executive branch and uh, regulations are made by the uh, also by the executive branch but a particular part of the executive branch which is um, it's, this is also by the executive branch statutory bodies what we call statutory bodies okay that's correctly spelt so an example of a statutory body is I see it also a statutory body you could say that but uh, a better example in this case would be SEBI RBI okay so SEBI RBI they have been set up as the as uh, you know the securities regulator and the banking regulator so what what we say notice that RBI rules when we refer to actually they are called RBI regulations okay now ministry of finance when it's making uh, rules those are called rules okay so ministry of finance is much closer to the uh, you know the the head of the executive branch okay so that's how you understand the difference between rules regulations and acts some people are quite sloppy about the use of these terms but that's not they should be you need to be careful you should be you should have the right idea okay so acts are made by parliament rules are made by the part of the executive branch that is closer to the head of the executive branch so income tax act rules are made by cbdt that is central board of direct taxes okay so they are much closer to the head of their part really of the functioning government okay and then uh sebi for instance will make regulations okay sebi re regulations uh, because sebi is slightly further away from the head of the executive branch okay slightly although they are actually bound to follow uh, the overall directions under the they are under the executive branch also okay so these we call statutory bodies uh, example sebi okay and when you're reading laws okay if you look at uh, various laws you'll see that <clears throat> when when we are referring to rules okay uh, okay so this part we'll discuss later uh, there, there is a particular way to refer to rules and the particular way to refer to regulations this we'll discuss later okay this uh, I don't know this program is still around you can check it there was a very good program on corporate law called the firm okay it was on cnbc tv 18 but this girl has actually left so i don't know this program is still on she has now gone to bloomberg tv uh so on bloomberg you'll have a program bloomberg tv you'll see that even on bloomberg quint there's a section on law okay so try to follow that try to make the connection continuously between the world of business and the world of law because you have to get uh, uh, comfortable with this idea of multidisciplinary approaches okay that is something else that is expected from mbas that you should be comfortable with <clears throat> a multidisciplinary approach okay because you're not just a computer programmer who's come out with a BTEC okay and is just a hardcore programmer you have a broader uh, training so you, that is one of the special skills that people expect along with communication skills and you saw that remember that uh, job skills survey that I showed you 
so strategic thinking so strategic thinking partly is very connected to the idea of being able to mm. connect all uh, to look at things from a multidisciplinary perspective okay that is also important from developing for developing strategic thinking skills so always be comfortable with this uh, looking at things from a multidisciplinary perspective okay so just check for this and let's check for the bloomberg thing so this ends our particular module here okay we have some amount of time so we are going to now get on to contract law okay okay all right so let's quickly start on contract law here this has to be smaller okay so you might have found the uh, the theory unit in uh, unit 1 a little bit boring but let me just uh, let me just clarify those of you who found it boring what i would say to you is you are not entitled to find it boring because you are not here to be entertained <laughs> boring only applies when you are going to see a movie okay you expect to be entertained and you find it boring so you are not even entitled to be uh, bored because you are here to learn you are not here to be entertained okay so whatever we are telling you now this is your good luck or bad luck that you are taught by us so you are subject to our decisions on what is relevant okay because you don't really know that much about the uh, area so whatever we decide is relevant we teach you and then you have to take that as a given and then you have to just master those concepts okay so if you think it's getting boring it's not even relevant right that i'm finding it boring it's not relevant because you're not here to be entertained <clears throat> like people sometimes say you know i don't go to the gym because i find it boring i prefer to play tennis but even if you go to the gym it's like brushing your teeth it's not you're not there to be entertained it's a job you need to do so you don't think of it as boring or entertaining okay like you never say that you know brushing my teeth is boring obviously it's boring but <laughs> then you don't uh, stop brushing your teeth because it's boring okay guys so these are various links i've given you these are easy to access they are not behind a paywall but uh, only thing what you should do is if you are actually involved in a case refer to this link okay the income tax website these are maintained by taxman all the acts are not there but many of them are there if you are actually involved in litigation some of these uh, other links i have given you they are easy to refer to but they are not always updated with all the latest amendments okay so the more reliable versions of the acts are here okay these are all the most of them are there but obviously many are not there okay one of the things that this one of the good things that this government has done is they have actually i think they managed to successfully do that they basically repealed a whole bunch of uh, antiquated laws which were not being applied so they managed to get rid of that that is part of the overall deregulatory effort but it needs to go further okay so you can see that the us being much much bigger than us much more prosperous than us they are actually much more aggressive on cutting regulation than we are and we are sitting here you know and and not cutting aggressively enough actually we have much higher uh, much you know uh, longer to go than those guys so we and their tax rates are already now lower than us their corporate tax rates are already lower than us and they are now no longer taxing on this latest tax reform that happened uh, india and the us are the only two big economies that i know of which tax the residents on global income <clears throat> so here what's happening is infosys being headquartered in india okay whatever they earn in japan they are having to pay tax on that also here okay now the us used to also have the same system like apple used to have to pay tax on its earnings in south korea uk everywhere okay but only if they brought it back okay and that's why they used to keep a lot of money outside but now they've changed even that see how aggressive now how competitive the us has become now in the us uh, this will cause a uh, you know a drift a lot of companies will now go and incorporate in the us because it's such a massive market and now they are not being taxed so samsung us will no longer have to pay tax on its income in korea and all those places okay if if a com company samsung is let's say headquartered in the us if they move their headquarters there now they don't know now microsoft being headquartered in the us no longer has to pay income uh, tax on its income in microsoft japan because now they have moved to what is called a territorial system now the us has a territorial system so they no longer tax companies on their global income whereas we are still taxing them on their global income so in many ways our tax system is less competitive our regulations are more onerous than an economy which is much much more bigger than us much more prosperous than us <coughs> anyway <coughs> these are all things you have to be aware of not connected to law as such so ex so explicitly but these are all things that matter in the real world all right guys let's start the contract law module okay um <coughs> so essentially some of these terms that you might hear in the uh, you know in, in a discussion of capitalism etc 
and uh, also uh, is is this concept of freedom of contract okay so in a free capitalist society one of the things that those societies which are marked by less regulation the principle that the governments try to follow is that they give the citizens the freedom of contract which means two people can come and come to any kind of contract okay so the, you, the government generally will not try to interfere with what is called this is considered a very important principle in a capitalist system that you respect the freedom of contract you don't try and go and tell them you can do, you can't do this kind of contract can't do this kind of contract okay so obviously one of the things that freedom of contract requires is that there should be uh, you know uh, mutual clarity on terms of the contract we'll see more about this later now just a brief idea on contracts okay uh, which is it's broadly we say that uh, contracts are formed by offer and acceptance okay this is a broad uh, you know just to get a broad idea we'll look at the technical definitions later <clears throat> so once the once the offer is accepted you have a contract which is formed okay so this is basically this to give you an overview okay but you will find that in the indian contract act there is no uh, there is no explicit mention like this that this is formed by offer and acceptance where you find it is in basically we have this in the sale of goods act okay if you look at this section 4 uh, <clears throat> section 5 okay section 51 okay so a sale of goods act is a, is dealing with particular types of contracts contracts for the sales of goods okay so this particular good sale of goods act used to be earlier part of the contract act so the indian contract act was actually a huge piece of legislation it's one of the most uh, really well written piece of legislation because we haven't had to change it much it was written in 1872 by the british and essentially it embodied many of the principles of the english common law of contracts so the advantage in the uk there is still no contract act so all uk contract cases are all decided based on common law principles okay but what we have as an advantage here in india is that you know so as to avoid you know disputes about because one of the problems in the common law system is you can have arguments about what is the ratio of the case so two people are arguing about what is the ratio of the case so if you had what we had essentially what we got in 1872 was a codified version of the english common law of contracts because all the principles came from there and we essentially our parliament codified it okay the british codified it into the indian contract act so it's very useful actually so um and in it initially we had even the partnership act what you know is the partnership act today that also was part of the indian contract act because partnership is based on a agreement between partners okay so that is also a form of contract a special type of contract so it was also partnership act was also earlier part of the contract act and then the sale of goods act was also part of the contract act okay so these are all different types of contracts okay so you have contracts in general then you have particular types of contracts so sale of goods is sale, i mean uh, contracts for sale of goods contracts for the sale of a particular type of contract so uh, here what it says is uh, so this point is the point is we're trying to make here is that a contract for the sale of goods is a contract which means it's a particular type of contract okay and so what they say here in section 51 you can see is made by an offer to buy or sell goods for a price and the acceptance of such offer so you can see one example of this uh, very basic idea of contract which is offer and acceptance that is actually written down in the sale of goods act <coughs> okay so let's go back to the indian contract act and look at uh, so you can look at this um, if you go here uh, we are going to just refer to this one actually i'm just taken out this so there are some typos here um is this font big enough for you kanika at the back okay so these are all now we are not going to cover all the sections obviously because it's very big uh we are going to cover the, most of the first part chapter 1 also and chapter 2 and essentially we are going to end at chapter 2 okay so up to about 30 sections all this stuff for contingent contracts okay like insurance and things like that this we are not going to cover because we don't have the time we need to go on to other modules okay so let's look at uh, <clears throat> there are some typos here obviously this is a typo okay you guys have to be aware of this um yeah there is not viable contracts actually voidable voidable yeah. this is voidable contracts okay so it's a it's a typo okay so we'll just use this um okay so let's look at uh, this this is you have the short title which comes in initially etc okay uh, most of the most of the acts you have a interpretation clause okay or a definitions clause in section 2 okay 
look uh, look at this definition clause here okay just try to eyeball this uh, definition here but we are going to actually study this uh, you can study it from either side but I have got a uh, is this too small now okay so just try to read this briefly here not not uh, and don't spend too much time on it uh, you see the arrangement of this interpretation clause okay or what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually um, go directly to my version of this and then you can study this at home on your own so that we can save time okay so you see that it is laid out in the contract that's it's laid out in a particular way you can see this when one person signifies so what are they mentioning in such in a in clause a what are they saying um, proposal in clause a they're defining a proposal okay then in clause b they're defining a promise then the clause c is promise c clause d is consideration okay clause d is consideration so these are all concepts that we have to be clear about then here you have agreement what is an agreement okay and then reciprocal promises what is a void agreement okay never say void contract okay agreement and an agreement and what is a contract so finally you have a contract okay and agreement and here then you have voidable contract okay um, which is the last one which is a contract which becomes void and here this i one i is actually a voidable contract this part there is no typo here so this is the arrangement here now i have done it in a slightly different way which i think is more logical in terms of the arrangement okay so let's try and look at and you can study it either way okay uh, you can just study it whatever way you want you can either study from my arrangement or you can study from the uh, act whatever suits you uh, whatever you find more uh, easier to understand whatever you find easier to understand okay so what I've done is I've done it this way I've gone backwards actually and I've tried to keep it more logical okay uh, keep the flow okay so first we start with what is a contract okay so we say that an agreement that is enforceable by law is a contract okay so that's the definition of a contract all right okay so uh, here if you go to this um, this is too big actually um, you can't see the other parts okay this is already in your uh, thing so this is how we should divide it okay the the coloring is not uh, proper it should be you have to make it even smaller than this oh my god it's 67 okay so it should actually go up to here and if we have this as let's say brown covering this okay so you have two types of agreements uh, you have either you have a void agreements I want to set center this either we have a void agreement and um, and let's make this something maybe it's um, let's give it a okay okay so you have uh, obviously maybe you can't read it now because of this deep red color I just wanted to give it a red color because it's void but uh, that is not uh, helping us okay now you can read it okay so the first classification is essentially you have two uh, two types of uh, you know agreements you have all agreements the overall class of agreements some of them will be enforceable by law so they are called contracts and those which are not are called void agreements okay so I didn't come to that part uh, I immediately went into um, all right so actually now the problem is I have reduced that size now this one also has gone down uh, this in this way I think Firefox is a little smarter Firefox does it tab by tab but Chrome is doing it for all the tabs okay or maybe it's a settings thing okay guys so logically trying to follow maybe I shouldn't have gone to the framework first I should have gone through this logic okay so first is uh, what is the contract the contract is an agreement enforceable by law okay now the question then for will arise what is an agreement because you are just defining contract in terms of agreement so now you have to define agreement okay it's like these you've seen these babushka dolls in Russia there you have you take out one doll and then the same thing you get the same doll in a smaller size so one after the other that kind of logic okay so uh, what is an agreement now agreement is essentially every set of promises okay forming every promise and set of promises okay uh, forming the consideration for each other is an agreement okay that is the definition of an agreement okay so now again you have a problem because you have defined agreement in defining agreement you have introduced words like promise you have introduced a word like consideration 
two new words have been introduced so now you have to define these okay now obviously the, there's another term also which you can uh, see uh, together which is every promise and set of promises forming the consideration for each other these are also called reciprocal promises you understand what reciprocal is uh, two way basically two way with some idea of equivalence okay because if you go and again you go into your uh, international trade if you connect it this is a big word now especially trump is using it a lot when he's trying to change the trade agreements he's always saying what he's saying i want reciprocity because the u.s tariffs are much lower and tariffs in other countries even japan eu uh, china are much higher even india he has also complained about so he's saying i want free trade but i want reciprocity so if we have 2% tariffs, you also better have something low down there, okay? So don't have like 15, 20% tariffs on our products. So reciprocity is another word that is coming up in international trade negotiations. Okay, so uh, reciprocal promises. So we, we had defined agreement in terms of promises and consideration, okay? So, uh, and then the other term is obviously every promise and set of promise forming the consideration for each other. These are also uh promises which form the consideration for each other are called reciprocal promises okay so this is another term now okay so now we have to define promises we have to define consideration okay so the next one defies promise so promise says what is promise simply <coughs> promise is a proposal that has been accepted once a proposal has been accepted okay that becomes a promise okay so we'll come back to consideration later but at this point we define we go on again the problem with promises you have defined promise with respect to proposal so now you have to go and define proposal okay so proposal is a little more complicated okay because it is worded in legalese but essentially it's a promise to do also to not to do this you have to get comfortable with in the law generally okay unless there's a uh, exception made specifically in generally when we say act we also include omissions okay that means omitting to do something okay forgetting to set the alarm okay that's an omission that is also going to be considered as an act so an act in the law it generally concludes omission so when we say promising to do something it includes the promise not to do something okay abstain from doing something you understand what abstain is yes. okay okay so yeah so is there a difference between abstain from doing and omitting to do what is the difference oh see if you say abstain from doing something and omitting to doing something uh there is generally no difference the sense only from a contextual point you might say that abstain from doing something might be a result of a previous plan or promise whereas omitting to do something has the sense of uh, forgetting to do it yeah so that is the loose sense but on generally there is no real difference okay, okay. so proposal what is uh, now we have defined it in terms of proposal proposal means now i promise to do certain things or not to do certain things okay i prom promise not to invoke the guarantee the company has given the bank a guarantee the bank promises not to invoke the guarantee and this becomes part of an agreement okay all right so uh, you know that other class has been released early so they are making a noise okay now we come back to so we have defined all the other parts remember we use the word proposal and uh, consideration promise and uh, consideration promise led us to proposal now we have to define consideration okay consideration is important to understand we'll have some cases on consideration also this is an important point to understand consideration is essentially think of it as any kind of uh, you can read that actual definition these are all taken from the act by the way okay i have just arranged it in a different way okay i've just arranged the clauses in a different way which to me seemed more logical okay that consideration is uh, anything that you think of it in broad terms as any kind of detriment okay so if i'm taking out uh, 50 rupees from my pocket and paying for a coffee i'm suffering a detriment because now my wallet is uh, lighter by 50 rupees okay so i am less wealthy now to the extent of 50 rupees okay but uh, uh, and from the other side that guy is giving me a coffee so his coffee and his uh, water and all that his stock of all that has gone down okay his sugar and everything as milk and all uh, gone down so he's parting with something so you can think of it in broad terms as detriment okay you understand the word detriment Oh. detriment means some loss or loss or damage or loss you know we think of it in broad, broadly in terms of loss not in the contract sense mainly in terms of loss 
okay i have lost something okay so even if i have to go and sit somewhere and uh, you know uh, like the security guard who's standing there he's not really uh, paying any money or anything but his time is being spent his attention energy is being spent so all that kind of detriment okay he's losing all that because he's losing the opportunity to do something else with that time okay so maybe our uh, alarm has let us down once again let's check it um, alarm has again let us down but okay now you just okay i haven't taken much time so the alarm business is not working we'll take gulati's suggestion and i will appoint somebody at the beginning of the class as a uh, timekeeper See, now it has come that's the story okay so this clock is a little slow no it's not slow actually the okay guys you can go now Hopefully the rooster has woken you up now. You can go and enjoy your break. Okay. All right.